This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The United States, once known as the world's policeman, may be becoming the world's greatest threat. Waging wars, triggering political turmoil, causing refugee crises, and economic and technological hegemony. What are America's covert goals that may be undermining democracy? Welcome to U.S. Democracy, a reality check. The United States of America, the land of the free, the home of the brave, the lyrics of its national anthem reflect the pride Americans feel about their country. But in regions where the United States has been obsessed with imposing its own values, oftentimes it is land divided and homes destroyed. The U.S. has a long history of intervening in other countries' domestic affairs in the name of promoting peace, human rights, and democracy. The means of intervention range from covert operations to military action. Twenty years after the United States toppled the Taliban, the world watched as the organization regrouped and reclaimed Afghanistan. Multiple deaths were reported in the airport chaos, a tiny fraction of the 176,000 lives lost from two decades of war. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. The United States launched the war following the 911 terror attacks. Going after those responsible for 911 was one stated goal of the offensive. Another was to bring stability to Afghanistan by making the country more democratic. The U.S. was following in its, its interest here, but it should have been clear from the start that this was never really about liberating Afghanistan, never really about liberating Afghan women, uh, never really about establishing a new state or, or democracy, but rather fulfilling uh, the, the strategic objectives of uh, American uh, superpower unilateralism. President Bush later expanded the mission, saying the U.S. had an interest in a democratic Afghanistan as a hopeful alternative to extremists. A bright future was projected for this country where, under American protection, women attended school, new businesses opened, and a free press became possible. But Afghanistan has taught American elites once again that there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all democracy. By any stand rational historical and political standards, the, uh, the occupation of Afghanistan was a total failure. The United States tried to remake Afghanistan in its own image. They did so with complete ignorance of the nature of society and history uh, and politics in Afghanistan. They ignored the tribal history, they ignore the traditional structures of cooperation between the different regions and tribes of Afghanistan. They impose their own puppet leader, try to impose a central government according to their own means. And the U.S. permanent occupation of Afghanistan was a strategic absurdity and an impossibility. Let's rewind. Lo Chun Hao is the Deputy Director of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the China Institutes of Contemporary International Relations. He said America's attempt brought in identity politics, which in return consolidated what he called a fragmented political pattern in the country. In terms of national governance, Afghanistan ranked 165 out of 180 in the 2020 Corruption Perception Index. Electoral politics became the means for parties to pursue their interests through bribery and dirty deals. The economy collapsed. The U.S. helped to establish an economy that now heavily relies on aid. Data from the World Bank revealed that by 2020, aid accounted for nearly 43 percent of the GDP. The private sector made up a mere 3.5 percent of the economy, according to a report by the OECD in 2019 due to insecurity, political instability, inadequate infrastructure, and the difficult business environment. In October 2021, my colleague Daniel Hahn spent weeks traveling across the country 
and witnessed the suffering after years of war and sanctions. He met with Mohammed Hashim, a farmer who had no choice but to grow opium to feed his family. Hashim owns a little over five acres of land where he cultivates opium. I do have other farms of pomegranate, potatoes and onions, but because the borders are closed, the whole yield has gone to waste. It cannot reach the international buyers. Grapes, potatoes, onions and pomegranates have been wasted. One kilogram of potato is selling for 50 rupees. With that money, we can't even buy fertilizers for the crops, which is for 10,000 rupees. But when I cultivate opium, the buyers come to my house to buy it in hard cash. We don't even have to go to the market to sell it. He says he makes around $10,000 a year from his field. During the times of foreign presence, Hashim's business was flourishing. The foreign forces personnel used to buy opium, hash and snuff and other drugs from the local farmers and paid hefty sums of money. After the Taliban took over the capital, Kabul, the group vowed to make Afghanistan a narcotics-free country. The continuation of the drug trade threatens to deter foreign aid for Afghanistan, a vital source of revenue for the broken economy. Absolutely, we are against drugs, and the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan is trying to eradicate the production of narcotics. But it is only possible when the whole world helps us in empowering the farmers and providing them an alternative to earn their livelihood. Another consequence of America's attempt to force its democracy onto others is the massive human toll. The cost of war project at Brown University estimates that more than 176,000 people were killed in the 20-year-long war. That includes over 46,000 Afghan civilians and two and a half thousand American soldiers. The real number of Afghan lives lost could be much higher due to disease, starvation, and other war-related factors. Almost three and a half months since a US drone strike hit, this house in Kabul. Devastated Romal Ahmadi lost three of his children as a result. Since day one, the Americans said it was a mistake and apologized. They also said, we'll evacuate you from Afghanistan and we'll pay you compensation, but they haven't taken any steps yet. We repaired our house and replaced our windows so that our family members would feel comfortable coming back home. But upon returning home, they broke down in tears to the point where we had to relocate them elsewhere. They say they can't live in this house anymore. I dreamt of my cousin Haroon. He said they're happy where they are now. When the bomb was dropped, it destroyed everything. Everything was ruined. In 2020, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani said 90% of the country's population we're living on less than $2 a day. Look at my children's situation here. They've been sleeping on mats for almost two days. Nobody is helping us with water, food, or a place to sleep. It is as bad as you possibly can imagine. In fact, we're now looking at the worst humanitarian crisis on Earth. 95% of the people don't have enough food, and now we're looking at 23 million people marching towards starvation. Out of that, almost 9 million are knocking on famine's door. The winter months are coming. We're coming out of a drought. The next six months are going to be catastrophic. It is going to be hell on Earth. With every war, the ruling military industrialists oligarchs enjoyed phenomenal growth of their wealth and influence, while young Americans, mostly underprivileged and poor, would sacrifice their lives in the sinister cycle of killing and getting killed. All in the name of the universal values of freedom, democracy, and human rights. In the United States, actually there is only one party that rules, the party of the rich and powerful. Democracy, the will of the people. But what happens when that will is ignored? Gun violence, racial discrimination, widened social inequality, needless overseas wars, and the worst record of COVID death. In an original two-part series, CGTN takes a hard look at how democracy is slowly eroding in the U.S. 
and how that could affect the rest of the world if it continues. Join us for U.S. Democracy, a reality check, only on CGTN. In 2019, former President Jimmy Carter said that in the 242 years since the U.S. became a country, it was at peace for only 16 years. From 1945 to 2001, among the 248 armed conflicts that occurred in 153 regions of the world, 201 or 81 percent were initiated by the U.S. Scholars from the University of New Mexico say, and these are their own words, since 1898, U.S. presidents have consistently combined military actions and democracy promotion despite the apparent contradictions. Others put it bluntly that America has reserved the right to decide which country can be called a democracy based on its own geopolitical interests. If it likes you, like the Ukraine, uh, no matter what form of government you have, it will call you a democracy and give you all the money you want. If you seek to become independent of American control, if you do not sell your natural resources to the United States, then uh, you will be uh, denied of the financial uh, basics that you need to create your own money supply and to fund your own economic growth. There is a long cherished democratic peace theory in Western political science scholarship that says democracies don't go to war with one another and therefore the world would be a better place should more countries become democracies. And with that belief in mind, Washington launched numerous other wars. The ideological rivalry between the U.S. and the Soviet Union led to the division of the Korean Peninsula. The Korean War broke out in 1950 and devastation ensued. At the height of the Cold War, Washington claimed that there would be a domino effect had Vietnam turned red. The U.S. launched a war halfway around the world to stop, quote-unquote, the spread of communism. In October 1983, President Ronald Reagan launched an invasion of Grenada, claiming the tiny island nation could become a communist state and therefore a threat. Washington Institute for Policy Studies recently estimated, in fact, that since 9-11, the U.S. expended $21 trillion for what they called foreign and domestic militarization. And these expenditures are going to continue on into the future. So that's really too much money. And the situation's been like this, that we need to pivot away from the military industrial security complex. It's what President Eisenhower warned us about in 1961 that grew into a monster on steroids in the Vietnam war and then even more so the wars that followed like afghanistan if any other country had bombed as many countries as the u.s has overthrown as many governments had uh, invaded as many countries as the u.s had the world would be up in arms but the united states feels that it has the right to do that right this notion of american exceptionalism as former secretary of state madeleine albright says if we use force it's because we're america uh, we're the indispensable nation. We stand taller and see farther into the future than other countries. Nobody else talks like that. But the United States has been getting away with it because the United States has been the world hegemon. Profits are fuels for this war machine. Behind the militarism of the U.S. is a network of deeply intertwined special interests. 61% of global arms sales in 2019 came from the U.S., out to the world's top 10 defense contractors, five are American companies. From 2001 to 2021, the stocks of these companies outperformed the stock market by 58%. To export democracy and foster regime change, Washington has more means in its toolbox than just military action. Covert operations by the U.S. intelligence apparatus are more the rule than the exception. Have we ever tried to meddle in other countries' elections? Oh, probably, but uh, it was for the good of the system in order to avoid the communists from taking yeah. over. For example, in Europe, uh, uh, in 47, 48, 49, uh, the Greeks and the Italians, we... We don't do that CIA. now, though. We don't mess around other people's well, elections, Jim. Yeah. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> In 1948, Italy's parliamentary election saw a pro-Western government pitted against a communist-dominated popular front. The U.S. National Security Council recommended U.S. agencies stop the Popular Front by all feasible means. And how? 
Millions of dollars were secretly funneled to pro-Western parties fueling massive propaganda campaigns to mobilize voters against the Popular Front. The CIA even forged the letters to try to discredit leaders of the Communist Party. Fast forward to 2013 in Ukraine. Protests broke out in Kiev after President Viktor Yanukovych suspended an association agreement with the European Union under Russian pressure. Demonstrators filled Kiev's Madame Square to protest the decision. U.S. Senator John McCain flew to Kiev to show solidarity with the pro-Europe activists by appearing on stage during a mass rally. To all Ukrainians, America stands with you. The unrest later became known as the Madame Revolution, which forced the democratically elected Yanukovych out of office. Many believe he could have served his full term until 2016 had there been no interference from the U.S. And McCain's appearance paled compared with the leaked phone conversation between then U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Newland and then U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Jeffrey Poyat. They discussed the post-Yanukovych government, including who would be in and who would be out, at a time when the democratically elected government of another sovereign country still had two years left before finishing its term. A look at U.S.-engineered chaos in foreign lands is incomplete without mentioning an infamous organization, the National Endowment for Democracy. The NED claims to be an NGO, but its formation was approved by the U.S. Congress. In the organization's own words, from time to time, Congress has provided special appropriations to the endowment to carry out specific democratic initiatives in countries of special interests. And there's a New York Times article you can find that describes that the United States, since the end of World War II, has probably intervened in over 100 elections. And Americans assume that if I intervene in elections, I'm a good guy. It's okay for me to do so. But in, in, in relations among countries, you can only have one law. So America should declare either all countries should stop interfering in other countries' elections, which means that if Americans don't want Russians to interfere in their elections, Americans must also say, we will not interfere in any other countries' elections. But the Americans, unfortunately, want to have double standards. And double standards are not acceptable. Democracy, the will of the people. But what happens when that will is ignored? Gun violence, racial discrimination, widened social inequality, needless overseas wars, and the worst record of COVID death. In an original two-part series, CGTN takes a hard look at how democracy is slowly eroding in the US and how that could affect the rest of the world if it continues. Join us for US Democracy, a reality check, only on CGTN. Washington has also resorted to technology blockade while trying to maintain its global hegemony. And that doesn't strike many as particularly democratic. A recent case involves Chinese company Huawei, the global leader in 5G technology. Citing national security concerns but without presenting solid evidence, Washington has banned Huawei's products from the U.S. market, cut off supply of semiconductors to paralyze the company's mobile phone business, and try to persuade other governments to give up Huawei's 5G equipment. Huawei is not the first victim of America's long-arm jurisdiction. The book, The American Trap, reveals how the U.S. conducts secret economic wars to maintain global dominance, even against its allies. Well, the American Trap is, is basically the way the U.S. is using uh, the law as an economic weapon to uh, uh, weaken their uh, competitors. So they're using a different uh, kind of uh, laws. I mean, uh, Alstom, uh, for Alstom, my company, they use the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, which is a law preventing uh, bribery. 
Uh, on the other side, you know, they used against uh, BNP Paribas, uh, the French bank, and against uh, Huawei, and the T another law against uh, uh, American sanction sanctions. So they have the, an arsenal of different laws that they are using in order to uh, put pressure on, on companies and to weaken the companies and sometimes to buy those, uh, Ameri those, those rivals to American companies. Back in the 1980s, Washington targeted Japan, which has surpassed the U.S. as the world's largest chip supplier. Japan's leading chip producer, Toshiba, became the target of U.S. legal and political assaults. The reason? National security concerns. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So we'll be talking to dozens of these companies and urging them to comply. Of course, if they don't comply, you know, then we have other tools in our toolbox to require them to give us data. I hope we don't get there, but if, if we have to, we will. In 2013, the U.S. used a corporate law to force a French company, Alstom, to pay the highest amount of financial penalties in American history and eventually sell itself to its biggest American competitor, General Electric. A huge loss for France and a big gain for GE. Similarly, in 2018, based on a U.S. extradition request, Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou was detained in Canada for allegedly violating U.S. domestic laws against Iran. Many analysts say Washington's real motive was to rob China of its leadership in 5G technology. There are various policy tools to achieve Washington's goals. Military action, diplomatic persuasion, technological suppression, economic aid, and so on. But if you look at recent history, it is easy to notice that Washington has favored one specific tool, economic sanctions. A new set of sanctions. Sanctions, sanctions, immediately sanctions. Sanctions should remain in place. If you visit the website of the U.S. Department of Treasury, you will find a list of all the active sanction programs the U.S. currently imposes on regions, countries, to very specific groups and organizations around the world. That long list, comprised of 36 effective sanctions, covers every continent except Antarctica. The Obama administration alone designated an average of 500 entities for sanctions per year, just in his first term. That figure nearly doubled during Donald Trump's presidency. And then came Joe Biden. The vocal critic of his predecessor did not fundamentally alter, but has instead inherited nearly all of the Trump-era sanctions programs. Many of these sanctions have been imposed in the name of democracy as Washington alleged human rights abuses. But who is to judge and verify these accusations and who is to evaluate whether democracy is properly served with these sanctions? A strong weapon to fuel those sanctions is the U.S. dollar. It began in the late 1990s and accelerated after 911. The U.S. government has been trying to enhance the dollar's position in the world's financial market. According to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in 2009, up to 65% of U.S. dollars in circulation were used outside the country. In more than 20 countries and regions in South America, Africa, the Pacific, the dollar is used as the de facto currency. Over the years, when the economy was strong, the U.S. would use these countries' money to make itself richer. But when the economy was underperforming, it would spread its financial risks to other countries. The, the point is that as long as the dollar remains the only, only reserve currency for the world, actually it's the global community, the global markets are bearing the uh, risk, including inflation risk, coming from the uh, U.S. government. The U.S. has also made it increasingly hard for financial institutions to engage in dollar transactions with sanctioned governments, companies and people. Many of those countries that do not accept the American democracy would be consequently marginalized in the global economy. Apply this economic, peaceful, silent, deadly remedy and there will be no need for force. That is according to the 28th U.S. president and arguably the founding father of U.S. sanction policies, Woodrow Wilson. Silent, deadly. He got that right. In Venezuela, U.S. sanctions had led to the economy shrinking by 80% in just six years. Once South America's wealthiest country, it is now one of the poorest in the world. In 2019, over 96% of the families in the country were classified as living in poverty. 
25% of the population needed humanitarian assistance. And let's not forget, both Iran and Venezuela are only two targets on that long list of 36 active sanction programs the U.S. currently operates. There are also Iraq, Lebanon, Libya, Belarus, Cuba, South Sudan, Syria, and the DPRK, and the list goes on and on. Let's look at Iran, which has been sanctioned by Washington for over four decades. While the aim is to resolve the nuclear impasse between Iran and the West, the sanctions have ravaged the Iranian economy and led to widespread suffering. But I ended the Iran deal, it was a ridiculous deal. As the Trump administration abandoned the Iran nuclear deal in 2018, it subsequently imposed what it is called the maximum pressure on Tehran. The American government claimed food and drugs would not be on the embargo list, but that claim has been proven nothing but a sham. The sanctions led to severe shortages of medicines in Iran since 2018. That has left over 6 million patients in the country who struggle with cancer, blood disorders, diabetes and other life-threatening diseases fighting for their lives under drug scarcities. That situation has only been made even dire by the COVID-19 pandemic. بعد یه داروی به اسم فابی پیراویر که برای کنترل ویروس خیلی مهمه دنیای دهکده جهانی همه به هم دیگه نیازمندیم ما هم به این داروها نیاز داریم چون تولید اصلی تو کشورهایی هستش که بیشترین تولید کنندش هستن متاسفانه شرایط تحریم باعث شده که حالا ورودش به کشور با مشکل مواجه میشیم Today, the U.S. remains the world's largest economy and the only country able to protect military power globally and oftentimes, under the guise of promoting democracy, it has cultivated hegemony, leaving a trail of bloodshed and turmoil around the world.